All right, my name is Barry Rowe, uh, and I will be discussing the use of a genetic algorithm and the wisdom of crowds approach applied to the 2D bin packing problem. Um, this is for CECS 545 Artificial Intelligence at the University of Louisville. Um, more specifically, we're going to talk about it towards the end, how not to solve this problem this way. All right. Um, so the uh, agenda is to go over the bin packing problem itself, kind of explain what it is, um, what the problem entails, the components, um, and what the goal of the problem is. Um, also some different variations on the problem, we'll discuss that as well. Then we're going to go over the bin packing problem solution. Uh, what a solution actually looks like, how we can code towards a solution, um, and what a, a solution to the problem looks like in um, a coded object. Then we're going to go through the genetic algorithm process itself, uh, how we apply it to the bin packing problem uh, solutions, and what the s general steps are through the genetic algorithm. Uh, this will be kind of a review of how a genetic algorithm works. Um, then we'll go over the aggregation technique I used in um, producing the wisdom of crowds answer to the genetic algorithm's results. <clears throat> uh, then we'll go over some of the results uh, that I got after running um, runs of different problems. And then uh, finally, we'll go over why I think I did not get good results, uh, and basically why my wisdom of crowds aggregation never improved the solutions that I found with the genetic algorithm. <coughs> Excuse me. So the bin packing problem. Um, the bin packing problem is a problem of simply adding items into bins in the most efficient way possible. Um, some of the components are the items which have to be packed into a set of bins, um, the bins themselves which items have to be placed into, um, and then additionally the rules for packing. Um, in this case it means what are the constraints to the problem, uh, as there are very different versions for the problem. Um, the items to be packed generally can be um, variable in size, um, but are either known to be a certain shape or known to be irregularly shaped. In our case we use a uh, regularly shaped rectangle um, of variable size. So our items are variably sized rectangles, always smaller than or equal to the size of our bins. The bins are generally fixed size um, and uh, based on the dimension scale of the problem are either um, a simple rectangle or a simple cube or um, in the simplest case a a number um, in a 1D bin packing problem so a simple size. Um, the rules uh, for packing uh, you can constrain the problem so that items must be placed um, in an only one orientation. Uh, so if you have a rectangle, rectangular item which is, uh, for example, one unit tall but ten units wide, you could constrain the problem so that you don't pack it so that it is a one unit wide and ten unit tall. Um, item but it always has to go um, so that the height is one unit. So the goals for the bin packing problem um, are simply to minimize the required number of bins. You want to pack as many of the items into, you want to pack all of the items into the least number of bins possible. Um, so a worst case scenario is where every item requires its own bin and you have a the same number of bins as you do items. Um, this is the worst case scenario and the least efficient use of bins. Um, 
uh, an easy case to produce that is wh where every item is the same size and every item is the size of the bins used to pack. Um, this will always result in a one-to-one -one bin to item ratio. Um, and also you want to maximize the efficiency of the bin use. This is actually how you minimize the number of bins. You want to pack the most items possible into each and every bin that you use. Um, meaning there's l as little unused space in every bin as possible. Um, so different versions of the bin packing problem. Um, you, the classic bin packing problem is the 1D bin packing problem. So you have um, essentially a set of numbers and bins of a fixed size. So say you have um, an array of numbers 1 through 200 and every bin is um, the size of 200. Uh, what is the most efficient way to put all of those numbers so that their sum is never the sum of each bin of numbers is never greater than 200. Um, clearly starting from the largest to the smallest you're going to have at least one bin completely full for the 200 item um, and then you go on down where you could actually pair them so uh, up to a certain point you would have to begin pairing them to um, the 199th nine uh, volume with the one volume so you've got two bins two items in one bin um, and so on the 2d bin is the same problem um, but with two dimensions so uh, you're working with squares, rectangles, or irregular shaped polygons, but only in two dimensions, so height and width. Um, and the bins are also rectangular, rectangular and have height and width, and um, remaining space can, is a set of rectangles as well. Uh, then the 3D is just uh, an extension. Uh, so you're working in three dimensions. You have height, width, and uh, depth. <clears throat> Um, and then you can also throw in variable sized bins. Um, this is less common uh, and we don't touch this in this example. Um, but this is where you have multiple options for your bin sizes. Um, so an, a real world example, this is, this is closer to real world where you have a shipping need and you have um, a bunch of available shipping boxes based on the number of items you have to ship. Um, and the size of those items may de will determine which set of boxes you actually use to package those uh, those items. Um, that actually makes the problem quite a bit more difficult uh, because not only do you have to uh, check every combination of order to optimize it fully, you have to check every. Not only would you have to check every uh, combination of item with other items in the packable items, but you also have to check them against all the different variable sized bins, um, which becomes very, a very large pro uh, solution set very, very quickly, <clears throat> which is why we don't touch it here, because uh, it's much more complex than um, I'm ready to solve, uh, in, uh, efficiently anyway. Um, for this problem, I use the 2D version of the bin packing problem. Um, so we use uh, the problem definitions have a bin size, which is the height and width of a bin. Every bin is the same size. Um, and then items are rectangular, so they have a height and width. Um, and we also apply a rule um, so that we do not rotate items to pack them. Uh, this is what I was talking about earlier with the orientation. Um, items always have the same height and width when you select them to be placed into a bin as they do once they're placed into a bin. You never rotate them. <clears throat> uh, so a visual example um, where we have uh, four items and a bin um, a bin that is the size of uh, a two by two um, translation of 
the size of an item and all of our items are the same size. This is a very trivial example. Um, you can see given the bin, one bin and four items, we would end up with a single bin required to, f uh, to fit all four items because they all four happen to fit into the same one bin uh, perfectly. Uh, if we up that to five items, then the number of bins required would be two, as you can see from the diagram. Um, and the first bin would be full, completely full and the second bin would be um, one quarter full. Um, there's unused space, but there's no way around it because we cannot fit that fifth item into the first bin. Um, and this is the optimal solution for that particular uh, problem. <clears throat> uh, so the structure of a bin packing solution, the things it has to do, um, it has to contain a map of items to the bins they're in, meaning we have to map which items are together in a single bin. Um, and this will give us our bin uh, packing solution. <clears throat> so we know, say we have 20 items, we know item uh, A, B, and Q are all in the f a bin together. <clears throat> we have to have that uh, relationship has to be con uh, used uh, or retained in our solution structure. Uh, we also have to have the placement of the items into the final bin um, so that we can actually calculate what the remaining efficiency is. Um, this means we have to know if our bin has uh, item A at the bottom um, or is item A at the top of the stack with other items underneath it um, or to the side of it. Um, so these two items, they seem like we're going to have a complex um, object to maintain this state. Um, and in first picking this problem for this uh, project, I really wasn't sure how I was going to structure it. Um, and then I got to thinking about it, uh, how we can structure it in the code. Um, and really, we can just use a simple ordered list of items. Um, that's really all we need. Um, this still allows us to keep the constraints of, or, or the um, data of how, how items are in a bin together, um, as well as how they're placed into a bin. And we do this by uh, keeping our packing algorithm that determines the fitness of a solution the same in all cases. Um, so what we this is so if we always place the first item into the bin in the bottom left of the bin and then readjust our bin so that it has uh, space to the right and to the top of it in two additional spaces we can always check the bin for the next item to see if it will go into one of those spaces and then once we have a solution we can just unpack the bins in, in the order in which they were packed and then we will always, given that solution uh, order again, we will always end up with the same packing order with the same number of bins. <clears throat> this allows us to generate uh, solutions easy um, because all we have to do is have an order list of our bin or of our items. Um, we reorder the item list and we have a new solution, um, either better or worse. So that's what makes it easy to mutate the solutions because uh, we simply just swap items or um, re reorder the items in some way and we've got a new solution. Uh, the great thing about this is it lets us reuse much of the approach used to solve the traveling salesman problem with the same uh, genetic algorithm and wisdom of crowds approach which is great because it's kind of proof of the TSP being an MP complete problem um, where the solution to the TSP can be used to solve any other MP hard problem, um, which is kind of nice to find out. So <laughs> that being said, how does our genetic algorithm work um, quickly? Uh, we generate a random pop. First of all, we have to generate a random population of solutions. Uh, so we do this by reading in our uh, bank packing problem and generating random uh, 
uh, ordered solutions um, of those items. So remember, our solution structure is just a ran is just an ordered list of items to be packed. Um, so all we have to do here is take the uh, items from our problem and generate random orders of them uh, until our population is full. So once the population is full, we run them through our fitness function, which is what I was talking about, where we place them into the bin um, until the bin's full, set the bin aside. Um, set that bin aside, it has no, it can never have another item placed in it, and then continue placing items into a bin until all the items have been placed into a bin. Um, this is very close to, uh, as an aside, this is very close to the first, uh, first fit decreasing um, algorithm, uh, which is kind of our benchmark used uh, later on in the results to see whether or not we're doing well. Um, the difference is we don't reorder the list first because that would uh, that would ruin our different solution uh, scenario. And in the first fit decreasing, you reuse bins. So if you if the first bin uh, ends up with 50% efficiency, it's meaning half of the boxes bin is still available, um, and you find a small item later in the list, you could put it in that first bin. In our case, we need to not do that to determine the fitness. Um, that way, the order of the items determines which items are actually packed in the box, uh, in, in the bin. Um, so once a bin is, once an item cannot fit in the bin uh, that was previously being used, that bin is finalized. That lets us segment up our solution. Um, so based on the fitness, we select the top uh, X citizens for crossover. This is a, in my in my program. This was variable. Uh, I could determine which what the uh, population parent size was. Um, I believe I used twenty um, with a population size of forty um, for each of these runs. So we our population is twenty, and we select the top half of those to cross over into new children <clears throat> in each generation. Um, so. Then we can let, then continue to select random parents from the crossover citizens, uh, so our parent citizens, until the new population is complete. Meaning, um, this we do this so that we don't keep, uh, going to kind of keep some more breadth in our search, uh, so that the parents aren't always generating the same children roughly. Because um, if we always put the top two together then we may quickly uh, merge onto um, not really spreading out our solution um, without uh, lucky mutations or lucky crossovers. Um, the crossover technique used in this is the same I used in TSP, so I just ran, we'll pick a random subset of the first parent, place it onto the same location on the child, and then fill in the remaining items in the remaining order from the second parent. Um, the mutation, uh, so then the next thing we do is mutate the, each child if, uh, as, as we're going actually, um, as we're creating the children, we'll mutate them if a random number hits our mutation percentage. I believe I used a 50% mutation rate in all of these runs. Um, then we check to see if our threshold is met or our maximum generations has been hit um, and then start over the generation or we've finished our generations and we've got the best solution we can find with that many generations. So then we're ready to take that last final population which should be the best of the best population um, over the generations. Uh, each generation should get better. Um, and the wisdom, uh, and then apply the wisdom of crowds aggregation. So the first thing I did was develop an occurrence matrix. So this means how often does a as does an edge between uh, item A and item B occur within the solutions provided to us as expert solutions to provide it to the aggregation technique. Um, so if um, item A and F are 
the first two items in every one of our uh, solutions, then they're going to have an occurrence equal to the number of expert solutions provided. Um, uh, similarly, if A and F are the first two or the middle two items, they will still be have an occurrence of the, uh, the number of expert solutions because we're counting the occurrence of the edge, not the occurrence of the edge in a specific place. Uh, then we apply the closest edge insertion technique on those uh, occurrence matrix matrices to pick the best edges. Um, so we take the occurrences and invert them so that they are um, so that we can minimize the occurrence ratio. Um, we could just as well have swapped this check and not inverted them and checked them to maximize the edge, um, but we really want to just be able to reuse the closest edge insertion algorithm used in previous techniques, uh, projects. So I, I inverted the occurrence and uh, that way we can minimize occurrence. It's the same technique I use for the TSP Wisdom of Crowds uh, approach, which um, while it wasn't a wonderful aggregation, we did often in large runs find a better than the genetic algorithm solution uh, after running through Wisdom of Crowds. So I, I felt even though it wasn't the greatest, um, it didn't have uh, performance like the uh, Lynn Kerning um, algorithm used in the white paper we were provided. Um, it was, it, it did seem like it was going to be good enough. Um, turns out it's not good enough in this case. Um, so either, either the it wasn't the crowd's aggregation is not good enough, or um, possibly my bin packing uh, algorithm is too naive, um, and the fish of uh, the use of available space I believe may have been uh, another cause of this but we'll get to that at the end um, so the results as I've already uh, alluded to the results were much less than expected um, we never um, found a wisdom of crowds solution that was better than the genetic algorithms best solution uh, we did often match the best GA solution with our wisdom of crowds solution uh, but we are never, um, never better. And in single tests, um, it felt like I was more often to get a much worse result with my Wisdom of Crowds uh, results than the GA algorithm produced just before it. Um, this turned out to be not the case um, over large run numbers, um, as you'll see in this next graph but it, it's felt much worse than, especially from the TSP solution in previous projects. <clears throat> so, uh, as here's a table of my results. Um, everything in green is a better number than its counterpart, um, which means all the green is under our GA only, uh, which is not good for our Wisdom of Crowds approach. Um, you can see that our worst uh, and averages were almost were actually always um, better in the genetic algorithm only runs um, than when we ran the wisdom of crowds as well. Um, what is good though is that in the best cases um, we were almost always able to match the best uh, genetic algorithm. There are only two cases where we did not um, match and that was in the random 100 by 100 bin, uh, 100 item <coughs> uh, list. Oh, and and these were these numbers were taken by running um, 100 uh, runs of 100 generation GAs with a wisdom of crowds at the end. Um, so that's how that approach worked. I, so that means I would run. Um, the problem through a GA for 100 generations or till it hit the threshold it always went to 100 generations and then apply the wisdom of crowds to the final set of the final population of the genetic algorithm um, the number of uh, boxes is what uh, you see so you can see the solve times increase as you go up and 
um, that makes sense because the number of boxes, um, we go from 10, 20, 30, 40, 50, 100, 200, um, as the number of items uh, to be packed increases, that means um, our, our algorithm is going to increase along with it. But you notice it's really not, it, it's not an exponential increase. Um, uh, we really are only, well, we're really roughly only 10 times slower um, when we increase the size set by, um, oh, uh, from 10 to 200, um, which is a, a much higher than 10, uh, 10 times. So, all right, uh, so visuals. Um, so running the 30, uh, 30 item uh, bin packing problem set. Um, as you can see it, from the graph on the right, um, we have on this graph um, the first fit decreasing the genetic algorithm generations and the wisdom of crowds result all overlaid um, and in this case they're all flat line at the bottom because from the initial run we got as good of a run uh, efficiency as possible and you can see the drawing of the bins there um, even visually I can see no way to get around three bins here so the number of bins is never going to be um, less than three in this case so it's always optimal um, and because of the nature of the problem that is also optimal efficiency um, there's no way to position those boxes those items around in the boxes to actually cause more of the volume to be taken up um, the only way in this case to increase efficiency is to reduce uh, in this problem is to reduce a uh, reduce a bin um, which cannot be done as you can visually see here there's not enough room in either of the right two bins to house the remaining items. It's mostly because of the two large blocks at the top of the leftmost bin. So then we move on to a 100 uh, item solution. And so now we have a much more interesting um, <clears throat> graph. Uh, and what is, uh, what's good here is that our wisdom of crowds and the first fit decreasing line actually do overlap. Um, the reason you can tell this is because you don't see the red line. Um, you don't see that uh, red line for um, for the first fit decreasing benchmark. <coughs> um, what's interesting, and, and it's probably a flaw in my GA, um, we actually produced better results. Um, you can see during between the 298 and 397 generations, uh, and then it dropped back down to a less optimal solution. Um, and we didn't catch that. Uh, we never fell back to the better solution after plateauing um, underneath. Um, so the top graph shows the efficiency. Uh, that is a available space. Um, or sorry, taken space over total space, um, which means we're roughly 72% efficient um, based on that number. Uh, and then the bottom graph is number of bins used. So as you can see at the bottom, uh, we did eventually get down below the, uh, get down to nine bins. And, and it's interesting because uh, that is an average of the number of bins so by the end um, our population had an average of um, closer to 10 bins but you can see in the left we still have nine bins um, and really I, I don't see based on that visual um, how we could actually collapse into uh, eight bins there may be a way to squeeze eight bins out of that with some of those little uh, thinner boxes but um, I really can't visualize there, that being any more optimal. Um, so that may actually be an optimal solution to this problem. Uh, it's difficult to tell, like I said. Um, so then we move on to the um, 
100. I'm sorry, I stated, I misstated before. Um, the first problem we were looking at was 10 items. The second item, the second result set was 30 items. And then this final one is the 100 items uh, option. And this one where we have the most interesting graph um, for two reasons. One, our first fit decreasing is clearly better in all cases. We never even get close to it in, um, uh, well, we never get close to the efficiency, um, which means we don't get that close to the bins. Um, in our genetic algorithm over the hundred generations, we kind of plateau there at that seventy-one percent efficiency and uh, between and roughly thirty-four bins. Um, and our wisdom of crowd approach actually is less than less optimal than the final GA value. Um, that yellow line uh, right under the the blue line there, um, the yellow line indicates our wisdom of crowd. Uh, result. This is a case where um, in this particular average out of runs um, we or in this particular run we did not get a wisdom of crowds that's as good as our genetic algorithm. Um, and you can see by the uh, on the left um, it, it's easy to see that yes we probably could lose at least one bin um, by manually moving some of the items, especially in those last two bins at the bottom right, uh, into some of the bins at the beginning uh, that have a lot of open space. Uh, rearranging some bins, we could probably get down two, uh, two bins easily, maybe all the way down to three. Um, uh, all, uh, maybe down three bins total, um, which would put us at the about the 32 bin mark, which is where our first fit decreasing algorithm actually ends up. So this final graph is the same 100 item problem run at um, 1,000 generations. Um, so we gave it, um, so if you notice back here, we've got, uh, I'm sorry, we have 500 generations. Um, you can see in the top graph there, 456 is the last one. Um, and then the very end is 500. And this graph, we go all the way to 1,000. Generations, so double the number of generations, and we really don't ever get any more efficient. Um, it actually just takes long. It, in this case, it seems to take longer to get to the same efficiency we had before, um, and that's again that's just an anomaly of the run that we did here, because um, the random populations cause that problem. Uh, not really problem, but cause that effect. <clears throat> But it's important to note that really putting more generations, giving it more time, giving it more mutations and crossovers really didn't help the genetic algorithm get any closer to the known good algorithm of first fit decreasing. <clears throat> and the wisdom of crowd approach still um, came in at that same less than optimal than the GA algorithm. So why I think it didn't do so well. Um, the packing algorithm. Um, the packing algorithm I used did not fully take advantage of available space. I could have merged some uh, available space using more complicated uh, 2D uh, math. Um, however, I just simply, as I added an item in, I would take the available space, it split the available space into two new available spaces, which are two new blocks, um, which were set to the right and the top of that item. Um, really what this means is as you add more items to a bin, um, the available space gets more and more fragmented and means more, rather than being total available space, it's more and more fragmented available space. So our fitness function may not be as optimal as it could be, meaning um, this could lead our uh, genetic algorithm to produce a little bit less uh, great results, meaning our crossovers are not going to be as good, meaning the expert solutions into our wisdom of crowds approach is not as good, meaning our wisdom of crowd aggregation is not going to be as good as it could be. Um, it all kind of flows downhill. Uh, and then also the wisdom of crowds aggregation, it just could be better. 
um, the way I aggregated them using the best, uh, uh, sorry, the closest in edge insertion um, based on occurrences is just not just not as good as um, a known good algorithm to solve that problem. Um, I really tried to just make it as simple as possible just to show I was really hoping that the approach itself would come through um, even if my algorithms weren't the best um, but it looks like <clears throat> it, the wisdom of crowd part just did not work. The genetic algorithm does however show results um, and it shows results well. Uh, as you can see we were only a couple bins off uh, from potentially all, all optimal in that last problem um, and tweaking tweaking the set settings on that genetic algorithm pro probably could get us there. Um, uh, tweaking more than I did already for the research for this project. Um, so it, it has potential but um, I think these are the items that just cause my approach just not to get quite where I thought it might get. Um, but that is my uh, information and my experience on applying wisdom of crowds to a genetic algorithm result set for the 2D bin packing problem. Thank you.